As I've gotten older and less bitter about how messy the world can be, I've come to appreciate the people in my life that make a difference. A simple hello or an offer of advice. Like most, I do have days that I wish I could be alone. I wish I could have nothing but my thoughts. That is what dust is. It is devoid of life, the color sapped from your field of view, sparking such a fruitless existence. Set 20 years after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, the NCR is in shambles. The Legion resorted to cannibalism. And even the Courier's closest allies are completely insane. Today we join our allies. Today we see if you can beat Fallout New Vegas dust while insane. Roughly four months ago, I created a video on my channel that covered this overhaul in a different light, one of sanity. You see, Dust has a sanity system not so different from the Karma system in the base game. If you kill innocent survivors, steal supplies, or resort to cannibalism, your sanity decreases. Last time I used a new item, called Thorazine, combined with alcohol to escape on a plane without going completely loony. This time around, we take a whole different approach. Join me as I reflect my true personality and relinquish my own humanity. To start things off here, I name my character Alice in reference to the fact that we will be traveling deep, deep down the rabbit hole. I create a character that suits my motives and my lustful desires before selecting my special stats. As someone who has played Dust before and literally cried while playing it, I feel that I am qualified to do whatever I want with my special stats. For that reason, I went with a very high strength, endurance, intelligence, and luck, while using perception, charisma, and agility as dump stats. You may think I'm mad, after all I always have been, but last run I ended up with so many special stat penalties that agility and perception were constantly at one, even if I had them at reasonable amounts. For my tank skills I went with guns, repair, and survival. For my traits I went with hot-blooded and skilled. Hot-Blooded synergizes with my special stat arrangement, and Skilled is a trait that makes the early base game a breeze, and I'll need all the help I can get in this run. Despite that last little tidbit, I'm going to replicate how I did last run, and store all my stuff in one of the metal boxes at the start here. Dust starts you off in a room of rooms. Doors lead all over the Mojave. Last time I just hopped in one randomly and hoped for the best. This time around, I explored each of the doors to come out to a decent spot. This did take some time, so in that time I'd like to talk to you about the difficulty I chose to play on. Last time around I went with hardcore and very hard. On the mod page the author doesn't recommend these settings because dust is challenging enough with reduced supplies, a reduced carry weight, and an accurate damage system to name a few of the kinks that one usually runs into. I received a lot of criticism regarding my choice in difficulty last time, especially when I complained about the difficulty of the overhaul at certain points. To those that criticized, I bite your thumb. And not in the sense of flipping you off. No, I mean that I bite your thumb clean off. Blood drips into my beard as I spit your flesh on the dusty ground that has come to rule my life. I lick my lips before admiring your look of utter disgust and fear. Rather than feeling fear, I ensured my difficulty was where it should be. I felt at peace. I was home. To start my journey, I went through the door that took me to Jean's skydiving. It was the closest to the locations I had planned to visit, and doesn't spawn you right next to an army of tunnelers, eager to add me to their boar fetish. Inside, I found the familiar crafting kit and looted the locker for some amazing loot. You may laugh at five bullets, but when used right, they can take five lives. Stepping outside, I see that I'm in danger before immediately putting my gun to good use. Dust is about thinking fast, aiming quick, and firing without hesitation. At certain points, I had to stab someone with a spear, loot their body for a gun, and use it on the next guy. It's intense. Even now as I write this script, I can taste the nerves I felt, wondering what was next. It's a thrill that I typically don't get in the base game despite always playing on the hardest settings. With the femur in hand, I make my way to Good Springs. In Dust, it's renamed Ghost Town and is overrun by wild dogs after the people here met their demise from a plague. One thing that Dust does well is set the scene. Bodies fill a wagon, more still in Chet's shop. A madman still digs graves. I am careful to loot as much as possible. Every resource could potentially save me from death or bring me a moment of pleasure. With the schoolhouse flooded with ants, I used various explosives I had gotten from the ex-powder kingers to deal with most of them, and a tire iron to deal with the rest. 
After that fiasco and a crap ton of experience, I head to Doc's house and loot as many medical supplies as I can. This nets me a few stem packs, but perhaps the best thing was the chemistry set that allows me to make a bunch of chems for the many orgies that I would soon be a part of. I also utilized the crafting kit here to make a few more supplies before heading outside to look around a bit more. It wasn't long before I found myself right where I wanted to be, the main reason for choosing to start near Good Springs. A hundred LR rounds sit on the cabinet in the bedroom in one of the houses. These bullets combined with the Silence 22 pistol in Chet's shop prove almost essential, in my opinion, to getting a good start and dust. There's a bit of debate that each cartridge should only hold one round, but at this point, if it's in the game, it's in the game. After trying to fight the dogs outside, I realized that I would need to toughen up a little bit before engaging in pet play. I slow down a little bit, being methodical about where I place my shots. Hey, uh, Owl, can we get a clip of you almost dying while squaring off with a dog? Thanks, cutie. Moving right along after killing another doggo, I visit the cemetery and take out the guy who has been digging for a few years. There is a really important item here that will be with us until the end of the run. If you recall last time, we got to the start of the Zion ending, but didn't have a shovel to get the key in the grave outside of the entrance. I won't be making the same mistake again. After looting the graves, I push north. While this might be surprising to some of you given the history of Cazadores in the area, one thing remains the same. It still sits in the grave, untouched after more than 20 years. No, I'm not talking about your virginity. Chance's knife has always been a good starting weapon, and I figured that, despite it being renamed to a sacrificial knife, that it'd still be a good bet in dust. Much to my dismay, I brought a knife to a gunfight. NCR troopers are now camped out here, so I pop a stealth boy and get to work. My ultimate strategy for dust is save scumming. While not particularly enjoyable to watch or to play, if I only have a few bullets, you better believe that I'm going to be making each one count. I make a big brain play here, and pop another Kim. Steady. Steady allows even those with terrible aim to become elite snipers. It essentially allows your sperm to immediately fertilize the egg. I manage to put all of them down before gaining my first level. I grab survival and the strong back perk for level 2. To make dust even harder, the mod author reworks several of the perks in the game to be more like traits in that they have positive and negative attributes. Unfortunately, many of these negatives makes the perks not worth it so I tend to stick towards perks that don't have anything wrong with them. You can't go wrong with more carry weight. Especially when you just single-handedly cleared out in an NCR camp and have access to all of their weapons. While this plan worked, it did use up two very powerful and uncommon chems. To make matters worse, enemies usually drop anywhere between 1 to 5 bullets, and their weapon durabilities are lower than hell, meaning that many of the weapons I carry are only useful for a few shots. The difficulty in Dust is so much more than just the in-game slider. After looting a little bit more and feeling pretty stacked, I immediately get put down by two of the soldiers that I missed in the carnage. Fortunately, I have the power of God and anime on my side, and I'm able to take them out on dates as well. It turns out that they are really into tentacles, which, I'm not kink-shaming here, aren't really my cup of tea. So I'm forced to end the thruple before it has a chance to flourish. Heading back into Good Springs with a completely new collection of pleasure devices, I decided that I should start heading towards Prim. Unfortunately, between the tunnelers, raiders, and the approaching knights, I felt that it would be best to stick around Good Springs a little while longer. In need of an alcoholic beverage, I head inside the saloon and put down a fluffy beast that has really messed up eyes. Here I'm able to grab some whiskey for a strength boost anytime I would need one and break into the old safe via some hacking at the nearby terminal. Since I was going to be around for a while, I made myself at home and took a nap in one of the mobile homes out back. I could still smell Easy Pete's musk on the mattress, which put me to sleep like a baby. A hunter did wake me up in the middle of the night for a booty call, but according to YouTube, I shouldn't be as sexual as I have been in the past. It's bad for business. Jumping ahead a little bit, I'm on the railroad near Nipton when two guys jump me. At first, I thought it was going to be a pleasurable experience, but when they started asking about my credit score, I knew their thoughts were unholy, so I banished them from this realm. After getting attacked from behind and narrowly escaping with my life after fighting a Night Stalker, I grabbed the second part of my plan, the huge backpack in the house to the left of the entrance to Nipton. While this guy does decrease our agility by 3, 55 carry weight is absolutely worth it, especially when agility is your dump stat. After heading outside, I deal with one of the ex-legionaries when I find out that the boys are back in town. 
This wasn't a pleasant surprise, unfortunately, and despite waiting a few hours, they didn't want to leave. After a few more deaths, I found myself on the roof of the building that I was just in. Throwing my butt plug in a nearby house, I ran towards the general store and just narrowly escaped getting a sweaty hug from Uncle George at the family gathering. Inside wasn't safe, of course, so after taking that guy's head off, looting whatever I could find, and waiting a few hours, I sprint into the night. Paying attention to your needs and dust is crucial. You can very quickly end up dehydrated or out of food, causing many players to resort to cannibalism. I, however, stumble across Bradley's Love Shack and make some delicious dog steak. Inside, I take out who I believe to be Bradley before grabbing some more water in the locked first aid box. Dust is really about managing resources and finding the best place to use them so that you can get more in return. Heading east, I remember one of the safe houses in the area and make myself as comfortable as I can when there is a pile of tasty meat on the ground. Speaking about the ground, when looting the safe house, I found a hatch to a tunnel that I must have missed when I was touring my options for starting locations. Stepping inside, I find the remains of an NCR trooper with orders of an evacuation for all NCR personnel. Notes like these really add to the environment that dust creates. I find another one on a Dead Brotherhood of Steel member that describes some of the nearby terrain and piques the curiosity of new players with a few escape options. After heading outside, I end up having to use roughly 20 bullets, putting down two tunnelers. Non-human NPCs aren't really fun to deal with in this overhaul, as it seems like they absolutely murder you until you can kill them easily, and then they run away. I'm not sure if that's just AI in the base game, but I've never ran into it before that I remember. Stopping by Harper's Shack, I'm able to loot a bunch of ammo and start making my way towards Novak. After roughly 30 minutes of crawling around on my hands and knees with a little bit of an arch forming at my back, I made it to what I had considered to be my base of operations during the last run. Overrun by cannibals, I fight to clear it out. This takes a lot of time, as I end up having to reload roughly 5 times for each encounter to make sure that it plays out in my favor. I genuinely couldn't imagine doing permadeath on this overhaul, as it would end the second that I'm out of character creation. I ended up trying to invite some of my new friends over for a party, but when that didn't work, I decided to run for the hills. They ended up chasing me obnoxiously far, but as soon as I was cornered, I was in the perfect spot to take them down. This allowed me to level up to level 3, and raise my survival up to level 70 so that I could grab the perk that is equal to the love of my life. Love it or hate it, the disadvantages are so worth it to me, even with dust tainting its beauty a little bit. Another thing that has been tainted over the years is my love for gaming. I used to love video games. As a kid, they were my escape from reality, a way to immerse myself in new worlds and stories. But as I grew up, that love began to be tainted. It started with my girlfriends in high school telling me that I was spending too much time playing video games and not enough time doing something productive. Then as I got older, my peers started to look down on video games as something childish and immature. At first I tried to ignore them. I still love playing video games, and I didn't want to give them up. But as I got older and started to care more about what other people thought of me, the pressure to stop playing grew stronger. I started to feel guilty every time I turned on my console or booted up my PC. I felt like I was wasting my time and that I should be doing something more meaningful with my life. It was like the joy of playing video games was slowly being drained away by the weight of expectations and societal pressures. It wasn't until I started to accept myself for who I was that I was able to fully embrace my love for video games again. I realized that it didn't matter what other people thought of me, or how I spent my time, as long as I was happy. Now I create content here on YouTube. Who would have thought? Sometimes people want you to change who you are. While there are times to succumb to those whims to be a better member of society, especially when cannibalism is in focus. Oftentimes, if you are passionate about what you do, you can inspire others with your message. So rather than throwing away the time and effort on a project you've been working on, or feeling the need to be someone who you aren't, be the best you you can be. Armed with both Lucky and Big Boomer, I show some feral ghouls who I can be before saying hello to some NCR soldiers. Despite their presence supposedly dwindling, they actually appear to be more common in the wasteland than what the literature we found earlier seemed to suggest. I had hoped to see about grabbing that combat armor that spawns near the wreck caravan in the base game, but some tunnelers and survivors pushed me into a nearby house instead. 
taking out the person inside gave me an excellent opportunity to calm down for a minute. With the weather outside being darker than my ex-girlfriend's extra appendage, I decided to wait a little while so that I could see. It was here, after a few hours of playing and eating strange meat, that I finally succumbed to insanity. I'll give you a few more milliseconds to pause and read this wonderfully crafted note before I drink some toilet water and kill a few ghouls outside of the Crimson Caravan. My original plan here was to travel through Freeside to get to the Strip, but as soon as I walked in, an army of ghouls were after me like I chase after feminine looking men. While I can't help who I'm attracted to, I can grab the key to the Northern Passage gates and take out the survivors inside that are blocking my path. In the comments of the last video, I was told that I absolutely needed to check out the Zion ending, and that since this time around I had a shovel, I figured that I should do just that and see what the note mentioned when it talked about a Wendy character. At first, Zion was kind of annoying to traverse with this heavy green fog hiding your vision. But after taking a deep breath and realizing that the landscape hadn't physically changed and that the mountains still peaked in the same places, I got around just fine. Spore carriers were rather annoying, but nothing that Radchild and Chance's knife couldn't handle. Making my way down the mountain, I saw what the note mentioned. The Wendigo. I went to run away, but it just immediately murdered me in one shot. I tried taking a different path, but this thing just spawned out of nowhere. Both times I peed my pants, but don't worry, I made sure to lick it up. Deciding that Zion wasn't the vacation that I thought it was going to be, I reloaded the save I made just outside of Freeside and seriously contemplated going into the sewers. If you don't know, the sewers took me around 4 hours last time because it was an absolute maze, but I was able to walk away with some decent supplies and a lot of experience. Realizing that I didn't want to suffer like that again, I stuck to the surface and killed a few more ghost people. I'm gonna level with you and say that this was really boring and didn't give me a whole lot of experience, so we'll jump ahead a little bit to where I started taking down some cloud victims in Westside. These guys were also pretty tough, because they have a natural regeneration like Radchild gives you, but I was able to replace almost every round I shot, which made it good for stocking up on resources. At this point, I was just trying to level up more so that I could grab the Irradiated Beauty perk, another perk that'll make this run a lot easier. During the last run in the sewers, I faced two main issues food and radiation. I couldn't eat anything that said strange meat on it because I couldn't lose my sanity, but that whole conundrum is solved by this run pursuing insanity. Radiation, however, is a whole other animal. A big source of hydration in the sewers is irradiated water, and right away is just about as common as my orgasms. Not very frequent for you new viewers. Because of this, we need the irradiated beauty perk to essentially erase 100 rads every time we fall asleep. This allows us to remove the rads we take on without completely negating the purposes of Radchild. These last few paragraphs really show how nerdy I am, but I believe knowledge is a worthwhile pursuit. Once upon a time in a small village nestled among rolling hills and lush greenery, there lived a young boy named Ethan. Ethan was an avid reader who spent most of his days with his nose buried in a book, lost in the world of stories and imagination. Ethan loved books of all kinds, from stories of knights to books of animals, and he devoured them with a voracious appetite. His parents, who were simple farmers, didn't understand his love for books, and often scolded him for neglecting his chores and duties around the farm. But Ethan couldn't help himself. The world of books was a magical place that transported him to faraway lands, and introduced him to fascinating characters. He dreamed of becoming a writer himself someday, creating his own stories and sharing them with the world. One day, as Ethan was returning home from the local library, he came across a group of animals gathered around a tree. Curious, he approached them and saw that a little bird had fallen from its nest and was lying on the ground, unable to fly. Ethan, who had read about all sorts of animals and their habits in his books, immediately recognized the bird as a baby sparrow. He knew that the bird needed to be taken care of and decided to take it home with him. Ethan spent the next few days nursing the sparrow back to health, feeding it and keeping it warm. He even read stories to the bird, hoping to keep it entertained and ease its worry. One day as Ethan was playing with the sparrow outside, he saw a group of animals approaching. It was the same group of animals that he had encountered earlier. They were carrying a large basket filled with fruits and vegetables. The animals explained that they had heard of Ethan's kindness towards the little sparrow and wanted to thank him for his compassion. 
They invited him to join them in their monthly gathering, where they shared stories and celebrated the beauty of nature. Ethan, overjoyed at the invitation, accepted and joined the animals in their celebration. As they shared their stories and laughter, Ethan realized that the world of books was not so different from the world around him. Both were filled with wonder and magic, and he felt grateful for having discovered both. As I discovered yet another entrance to the sewers, I realized that I was destined to crawl through the deadly irradiated maze. Because we've already been through this side of the urinary system once or twice, let's pump it into high gear for a bit. I disarm some landmines, run past some ghosts, say hello to a few cannibals with my weird deadly makeshift plasma gun, got myself trapped into a corner causing me to go Super Saiyan, Goku is hot by the way, grab more lockpick and the stonewall perk at level 5 so that ghosts and tunnelers can't knock me down, made my way deeper into the urethra, added a scope to my hunting rifle, played a few too many games of peekaboo, Killed the guy for his flamethrower. Killed another guy for looking way too cool in the apocalypse. I'm just jealous because my clothing has weight. Spent 8 bolts on a guy who looked like he was about to fulfill all of my horror fantasies. Drank some delicious water. And spent longer than I really care to admit to get all the headshots on the people at the monument. Despite knowing where to go and my quick editing style, this section still took obnoxiously long, so I'm glad that we can put this behind us. Grabbing the key to all the sewer crates, I start making my way out when I see something on my pit boy. In the irradiated room, there is apparently a grate that leads on to the strip, a place that I didn't go last time because I was unable to figure out how to get to. As soon as I get to the surface, a red cloud floods my vision and I begin taking damage. While Radchild helps combat the constant health deduction to a certain extent, I am quick to find a way out of the fog and end to the next area. Killing off a few people using the axe I got off of that one guy with the robot head, I level up just outside of the NCR embassy. More melee weapons and the super slam perk allows me to slowly wipe out everyone inside and grab the key to the monorail. I was going to check out the nearby art studio, but I really felt a little discouraged when around a dozen cloud victims popped out of nowhere. Grabbing a little bit more rest to reduce my radiation from the irradiated beauty perk, I take out a few ghouls at the monorail station with some clean headshots and board the monorail. Still somehow in working condition, the monorail gets me to Camp McCarran where I kill a crap ton more ghouls. After half an hour or so of fighting for my life, I make a hard save and board the vertebird. Of course, I crash land in the Sierra Madre and have to run mindlessly past a bunch of ghosts who are significantly beefed up, likely due to my pussy. Fortunately, I'm able to get the sewer key from Father Elijah, read an obnoxious amount of lore that essentially tells me that he was pregnant and died when in the birthing process, walk through a deep dark maze, and let my way to safety, proving that yes, you can beat Fall into Vegas dust while insane. Sometimes I ask myself if the things that I've done in my life were really worth it. If it's somewhere in all the bad that the good that I have done has paid for those sins. But to ask such a question would ruin one's own sanity. For all the paths you could choose, you've ended up here. But what if... what if you could go back? Change what you've done? Would it be worth it? Would Alice change who she was? Climbing up the vertebrae a second time, I found myself chasing after another ending. Rejecting freedom gives me over 2,000 experience and 2 levels. For level 7, I grab guns and the ghost hunter perk so the ghosts stay dead when their health bar is empty. For level 8, I grab more guns and the scurrier perk. If you haven't noticed, all of my limbs have been crippled for a long time, so in exchange for being more likely to be crippled, a 50% increase in movement speed will synergize perfectly with not having medical supplies. With the beginning of a new chapter, I ran to the monorail once again so that I could get out of Camp McCarran. There might be another exit that I'm not aware of, but I had more business on the strip. Boarding the monorail, I found myself in the remains of the Ultralux. With notes all over the place and traps preventing me from being able to walk three feet without blowing up, this place was completely changed, and I absolutely loved it. There wasn't much content here, but something about the atmosphere chilled me as if I was able to appreciate my own descent into madness from a looking glass. 
Grabbing some armor and the Ranger Sequoia, I drink out of the cleanest toilet that I have ever had the pleasure of embracing before jumping across the fog and visiting the tops. I wasn't able to explore much here because of all the ghosts and my complete lack of ammunition, but I did feel really badass with this clip when I jumped off of the destroyed section and shot a clawed victim while on the air. Taking another catnap in Cracker's old bed and climbing down the grate again, I start making my way through the sewers. Unfortunately, all of my old friends had respawned, so I did my best to run past them when I could and shoot at them when I couldn't. But it wasn't long before I found myself at the exit of the sewers and once again fighting for my life in North Vegas Square's The Gray. Here I'm able to grab some more food, waste a bunch of ammo, and leave into the ghost-infested streets. The next two large sections are me just grinding for experience. Nothing crazy happens, but I do clear out the Crimson Caravan and Boulder City. For the Crimson Caravan, I lure them all individually to one of the bunkhouses so that I could get the drop on them. This takes a while, but I actually got a lot of ammo from it, so it wasn't a complete waste unlike me launching my seed down the drain. For Boulder City, the ghosts proved to be absolute tanks. I really hate to think about how long it took to just kill one of them, let alone all of them. But using a combination of spears and firebombs seemed to do the trick so that I could serve ammo for the road ahead. Here I leveled up to level 9, allowing me to grab more melee weapons and the King Arthur perk for supposedly more melee damage. I personally didn't notice a change, but that makes sense considering that most of the perks and dust are completely broken and do literally nothing. Speaking about a king, in Jessup's old hangout, you can find the king's remains on the mattress in the back. It turns out that he ended up here, and that his men tried to get him to safety when crap hit the fan. The ending that was most requested in the last video I did about dust was Zion. I felt that it would be a shame to just leave through the Sierra Madre and call it a day, so here we are again in Zion with another attempt. This time around I brought a flamethrower so that I'm able to scare the Wendigo away, but the problem is that I don't have very much fuel for it so I need to be a little stingy with my trigger finger. In light of that, and to avoid needing to be able to see more than 5 feet in front of me, I head north through the irradiated water to avoid any spore creatures, and hopefully the Wendigo itself. I end up cutting in a little close with the rads, but fortunately I'm able to get to what remains of the Soros camp with a few rad away. Because things couldn't ever be simple for me, the NCR stationed at the camp can magically shoot into the fog with infinite ammo because, you know, why not? It takes several attempts and one or two mental health breaks, but eventually I get inside White Bird's cave where I obtain the key for Pine Creek Tunnel. I really can't overstate how much time was spent and how many reloads each of these sections took. You really need to be near perfect with your accuracy to be able to successfully live through dust. Fortunately, I have a few lucky misses here, and I'm able to use a spear to knock the weapon out of the trooper's hand so that they can't shoot at me anymore. I would call that a big brain play, but at this point, I just want to cry and have someone run their fingers through my hair. Because there ain't no rest for the wicked, and money don't go on trees, I burned through all of my flamer fuel, trying to get to Pine Creek Tunnel. I died so many times here that I seriously contemplated reloading a save before I went into Zion so that I could just grab more fuel. It was crazy, and my butt was clenched so hard that it felt like I had a 2.5 inch butt plug up my rear, but eventually I made it to Pine Creek Tunnel. Here I ended up finding Wake and Cobb's body, which had a note that basically said that I was screwed and that I should give up now before I have a brain aneurysm at the ripe age of 33, but I continued pushing regardless. The overhaul refers to this new area of the game as the Long Dark, and rightly so. It is both long and dark. In case you missed the joke I made earlier about the exact same topic, it reminds me of my ex-girlfriend's extra appendage. I don't know what comedic timing is, but I'm pretty sure I'm really late. I die a few times in this hellhole before ending up on the other side, and dying a few more times due to ammo shortages. Dustwalkers wait in ambush just outside of the exit to the long dark, and I painstakingly put them all down, including the ones in the areas below the overpass. I genuinely had tears at one point as they rolled down my face onto my mustache. The salt in them turned my guts upside down. Something was wrong here. It shouldn't be like this. After staring at the death claws blocking my path, I go to the dust wiki to find how the hell that I'm supposed to beat this stupid game. The wiki turned around and called me stupid for missing the key in this cabinet that is hidden in the dark and a crap ton of debris. I then had to walk all the way back through the long dark where I met with a different ending than before, with essentially the same taste. By the way, look at how much I suffered. I was thirsty, hungry, radiated, and all of my limbs were broken. Broken like me. This mod pack is insanely boring at times. Walk, die, and walk again. 
Everything beautiful is covered up with weather elements and death, while the loot scaling makes you completely terrified at your inability to carry anything. I can't comment on the difficulty of this mod too much because I really don't feel like tasting anyone's fingertips, but this genuinely sucked. This time around I had a lot more experience with what dust mechanics were like, so it made it a little bit easier, but the lack of ammo and supplies still irritated me as I felt like I had no sense of progression. A lot of people commented on the existence of the courier and dust, so I wanted to comment on their existence and show how absolutely amazing their implementation is into this super complex overhaul. I'd like to thank my patrons for supporting my content. You guys are amazing, and really encourage me to be able to improve my videos with new equipment and spending more time on them. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, you should check out another one here. I've been Owl, but do me a favor, will ya? Have a good one.